If you watch a lot of math videos or have taken a lot of advanced math classes, you've no doubt run across this gamma function. Mathematicians and enthusiasts love this function because it generalizes the factorial. Traditionally, factorials just meant n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on. For example, 4 factorial means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. But using the gamma function, we can compute things like 1 half factorial, whatever that means. And if indeed you have come across this function, it's probably just been handed to you. It has a wide variety of applications and is really useful for solving problems. I've been guilty of this in my videos, I just pull the gamma function out of thin air to solve my problems. And if you've used the function yourself, you probably used it in a similar manner. Now, there's no question that the gamma function works. It definitely generates factorials. In fact, it's not that difficult to prove, since factorials are mainly defined by this recursive formula, n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial. It might be a little tedious with some integration, but you can certainly verify this. If you plug in gamma of 1, that's 1 or 0 factorial, and so there you go, this definitely generates factorials. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this always left me wanting more. I sort of wanted to know where it comes from. Why does it generate factorials? And the answer I was always given was, it just does. So in this video, I want to lead you through a process, hopefully an intuitive one, that you could imagine yourself actually discovering this on your own. So let's pretend, for argument's sake, that we have no knowledge of the gamma function, or any function for that matter, that generalizes the factorial. All we know is n factorial for natural numbers n. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to create a function that should generalize this. In calculus, one of the first things you learn is the power rule for derivatives. And what you might notice if you take derivatives of power functions, it almost starts to create something like a factorial. For example, if you take the derivative of x cubed, you get 3 times x squared. Take the derivative again, and if you don't multiply the terms together, you get 3 times 2 times x to the first. One more derivative would be 3 times 2 times 1. That's very reminiscent of this factorial idea. So take x to the n. Now, if I wanted to be super rigorous about this, I should probably use mathematical induction, but we'll just do some pattern recognition and see if we were to take n derivatives, we would get n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down times 3 times 2 times 1. That's n factorial. And so already, just with a few weeks of calculus, we have something pointing in the direction of what we're going for. On the other hand, we haven't really gotten anywhere. It's not like I can just plug in a number for x and take n derivatives. That would just vanish. In fact, all we really said is a restatement of the definition of factorials. So where do we go from here? It would be nice if the thing that we were deriving created factorials like we want, but also didn't disappear. I want something to remain that I can substitute values into and generate new factorials. Now, probably in the same lesson you learned the power rule, you probably also did derivatives with negative exponents. And one of the properties of deriving a power function with a negative exponent is that it never really disappears regardless of how many derivatives you take. So maybe you would try playing around with x to the minus n. Take the derivative, you'd get minus n x to the minus n plus 1. Remember we're subtracting 1 from the power here. In other words, adding negatives. So this is not going to disappear in the same way that x to the positive n would. Thing is, if we keep taking derivatives like this, we're not actually generating any kind of factorial. We're just writing this alternating power of n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 
for as long as we'd like to take derivatives, and we could go forever. You liked the idea of taking n derivatives and coming up with n factorial, and we liked the idea of using negative exponents so our function doesn't disappear. Then you realize, since the last time we were counting up when we derived n, n plus 1, n plus 2, instead of starting with an exponent of n, let's start with an exponent of 1, negative 1 that is. Now what happens when we take n derivatives? Do n derivatives and we get our n factorial. Mind you, it's attached to this alternating term and this x to a power term. And we're getting closer to something that we'd like. We can see if we take n derivatives of 1 over x, we create something with an n factorial in it. Just to make things look a little nicer, we could multiply both sides by negative 1 and combine things with properties of exponents. So we found a new relationship between our power function and n factorial. And this is something to be proud of in itself. But it's not exactly what we're going for. What we want to do is plug in a value for n and have a value for n factorial. In fact, it'd be really, really nice if we could just substitute, say, x equals negative 1 into both sides. Then we would just have n factorial on the right. And on the left, well, plugging in negative 1 isn't going to work. However, maybe we can find a different representation for the left-hand side. What if we found a different representation, took n derivatives of it, and then plugged in negative 1 for x? That should do the trick. So now the question is, what's a different representation for minus 1 over x? something that would lend itself to taking n derivatives. We don't want to take n derivatives just willy-nilly. That's a lot of derivatives and can complicate things. Using our calculus knowledge, let's think of something that's easy to take derivatives of. Well, the easiest derivative I can think of is the derivative of the exponential function, e to the x. It's its own derivative. Take as many derivatives as you like. It's not going to change the function. But minus 1 over x and e to the x are definitely not the same function. But thinking back to your derivative rules, when you take the derivative of e to the x, it's e to the x. If you take the derivative of e to the x t, here t is the variable, we'll take the derivative with respect to t, x is a constant, the derivative of e to the x t is x e to the x t. Well, how does that help us? It doesn't necessarily, but if we reverse the process, if we integrate this with respect to t, the antiderivative of e to the xt is e to the xt divided by x. And we can use this fact to create what we want. A good place to start is usually 0, since e to the 0 is 1. That would be really nice if we just plugged in 0 for t, then we would get our 1 over x. And we want our upper limit of integration to also be something that when we substitute in, our exponential function is going to disappear. Well, there's no other nice real number that's going to do it in this case. How about we do infinity? Let's perform this improper integral. Because then, if we take this limit as e goes to minus infinity, well, that disappears to zero. So this is true provided the value of x is negative here. This is something you might just stumble on doing practice problems for improper integrals, but it lends itself extremely well to what we want, since we have already figured out if we take n derivatives of both sides, we create a factorial. So let's do just that. Let's take n derivatives of both sides with respect to x. We've already figured out what that is on the right. That's n factorial over minus x to the n plus 1. On the left, we need to do n derivatives of this definite integral. And fortunately, the derivatives are derivatives of 
x. That means we can differentiate under the integral sign. We can sort of slip this in and take n derivatives of e to the xt with respect to x. Now we know what this derivative is. The derivative of e to the xt with respect to x is t e to the xt. We're doing that n times, so we have to multiply by t n times. And if you recall what we wanted to do with this, we wanted to substitute x equals negative 1. When we do that, the denominator on the right hand side disappears, we just get n factorial, and on the left, there it is, the gamma function. I should note here, we only technically proved this for natural number n, not all the numbers we were looking for, but it does happen to work out. Check out the video on the screen next. I think it'll give you a new perspective. I'll see you in that one.